The first principle of component design is the reuse release equivalence principle. Imagine you are reusing a logging component from a different team. Apart from proper functioning and useful documentation, you also expect that each release of this component is properly versioned. Proper versioning allows you to track changes such as bug fixes and improvements and decide when to upgrade to a particular feature set. Now, imagine this team also provides a library for parsing configuration files and decides to include this library in the same component for convenience. To release an update of either the configuration file parser or the logging functionality, the entire component must be released. If you use the configuration parser in your application as well, you cannot integrate logging changes independently from changes in the configuration parser and vice versa. This might not sound like a big issue, but suppose you need an important fix in the logging functionality for the current release of your application and at the same time the configuration parser contains breaking changes you don't want to integrate yet. Therefore, the reuse release equivalence principle demands the granule of reuse is the granule of release. The second principle of component design is the common reuse principle. Consider our previous example of a logging library and a configuration parser being part of the same component. Let's assume in your application you want to manage your configuration with a different library, so you no longer use the configuration parser from that particular component. However, every time this component is released by the other team, you need to revalidate your application to ensure everything still works as expected. This causes unnecessary effort if the release is not related to the functionality you are using from this component. Now let's further assume the other team introduces a dependency on another component to support managing configurations in databases. This adds an indirect dependency to your application even so you are not using this functionality. In contrast, if the other team puts a class for efficient datetime formatting in a separate component, even so the logging implementation relies on it, you need to manage this additional dependency. This increases your application's complexity and maintenance cost. Therefore the common reuse principle demands the classes in a component you reuse together. If you reuse one of the classes in a component, you reuse them all. This means well-designed components should be inseparable. Classes that are not tightly coupled should not be in the same component. In the end, applying the common reuse principle results in smaller components with high cohesion among the classes inside the component. The third principle of component design is the common closure principle. Imagine a classic layered architecture where features are distributed across different components and layers. Components in the presentation layer contain the UI related parts of a feature. Components in the application layer contain classes implementing all business aspects of a feature. And components in the persistence layer contain classes related to the persistence of a feature. When a requirement change occurs, it likely leads to changes in several classes across different components and layers. This increases the number of components that need to be tested and released, raising overall maintenance costs and increasing the risk of unintentionally affecting other system functionality. The principle of closure in this context means that classes within a component are grouped together because they are likely to change for the same reason. If classes that need to change together are part of the same component, the changes are localized and isolated. Therefore the common closure principle demands the classes in a component should be close together against the same kind of changes. A change that affects a component affects all the classes in that component and no other components. Components are rarely completely independent. They often depend on each other, allowing us to build complex software from smaller pieces. These relationships can be visualized as a directed graph, where the edges point in the direction of usage. The acyclic dependencies principle states that we should not allow any cycles in such a component dependency graph. But is a cyclic dependency something that can actually happen? Trying to create a cyclic dependency between projects in your IDE would result in a solution that wouldn't build, right? But remember, components are binary units. Their dependencies are resolved via a component registry like Nugget in .NET. This would allow creating a cyclic dependency if initially the cycle does not exist so that each component can be built at least once and uploaded to the component registry. Then a cyclic dependency could be introduced without causing any build issues because each component could fetch an older version of its dependencies from the component registry. So why is this a problem? The obvious issue is to determine the correct build order to achieve consistency in your application.
In the case of a directed acyclic dependency graph, this is a simple task. The components are built in the reverse order of the graph. But where is the beginning of a cycle? These thoughts lead to the second problem. Component dependency graphs with cycles are much harder to understand, especially when analyzing the possible impact of changes. Furthermore, cyclic dependencies can even lead to non-deterministic behaviors in your software. For instance, suppose your components need to be initialized during the startup of your system. In which order should that happen? So how do you break such a cyclic dependency? Imagine you need to introduce a dependency on class level that would cause a cyclic dependency on component level. Then you can resolve it with the following options. The first option is to use the dependency inversion principle, which I explain in depth in this video. The second option is to extract the code that both components depend on and move it into a new component. Now that we have clarified that component dependencies form a directed acyclic graph, let's talk about stability. As developers we know that software is supposed to be soft, meaning it should be easy to change. We even expect requirements to change frequently. Now imagine a design like this. If requirements change and component A needs to be changed, we can easily apply those changes as no other component depends on component A. Now imagine an alternative design like this. If requirements change and component B needs to be altered, this could get quite difficult because of the other components that depend on component B. Any change in component B may impact those components. So we could also say component B is quite stable because of the high amount of work required to make a change in that component. Is there a way to quantify or measure the stability of a component? Yes, there is. We count the number of classes outside this component that depend on classes within this component. And we call this number CA the afferent couplings. We also count the number of classes inside the component that depend on classes outside this component. And we call this number CE the efferent couplings. Then we can compute the instability metric I by dividing CE by the sum of CA and CE. This metric ranges from 0 to 1. An I value of 0 indicates a maximally stable component. It depends on no other component but has many components depending on it. It is the hardest to change but has no dependencies that might force it to change. An I value of 1 indicates a maximally instable component. It depends on other components but is quite easy to change because it has no components depending on it. In order to achieve designs that are easy to change, we want components we expect to be volatile to not be dependent on by a component that is difficult to change. Otherwise the volatile component will also be difficult to change. Therefore the stable dependencies principle demands that components should depend in the direction of stability. Meaning the I metric of a component should be larger than the I matrix of the components that it depends on. But how do we avoid that stable components depend on components that are supposed to be flexible? We simply apply the dependency inversion principle again and either invert the dependency directly or we extract an interface into a separate component. And what about those stable components? These components should contain the architecture and high-level design of our software. In fact, we do not expect and also do not want them to change frequently. But if our high-level design is hard to change, does this mean it is inflexible? This question brings us to the third stability principle, the stable abstractions principle, which states, a component should be as abstract as it is stable. This means stable components should also be abstract so that they can still be extended despite their stability. On the other hand, instable components should be concrete as its instability allows its code to be changed easily. Following the stable abstractions principle, stable components do not cause inflexible designs as such components contain classes that follow the open closed principle and so remain extensible and flexible. We can measure the abstractness of a component by counting the total number of classes in the component NC and the number of abstract classes and interfaces in the component NA. The abstractness metric A is then computed by dividing NA by NC. This metric ranges from 0 to 1. A value of 0 means this component contains no abstract classes. And a value of 1 means this component contains only abstract classes or interfaces. We can now combine both metrics, the instability and the abstractness metric in a graph, which helps us identifying good components and those which are rather problematic. In the upper left corner we find the maximally stable and abstract components, which contain the architecture and high-level design. 
In the lower right corner, we find the maximally instable and concrete components, which are flexible and are expected to change often. The upper right corner contains maximally abstract but unused components, also called the zone of uselessness. These components practically contain dead code. The lower left corner contains highly stable and concrete components, which can be very painful to change if required. Therefore this part of the graph is called the zone of pain. In this zone we often find utility classes. Of course, many components will not fall into any of these extremes. Components usually have a degree of abstraction and stability. From this we can conclude, volatile components ideally should be located in an area of the graph, which we call the main sequence. We can now compute the I and the A matrix of all the components in our system, plot them on the graph and identify components that are too abstract for their stability or too instable for their abstractness. Those components would not be on the main sequence. The higher the distance from the main sequence, the more problematic a component might be. We can even compute the normalized distance D by taking the absolute value of A plus I minus 1. The D metric ranges from 0 to 1, where 0 indicates that a component is directly on the main sequence. We can now measure D of each component over time, define a control limit and use this metric as an indicator for refactoring. Now that we have covered all six principles of component design, I would like to ask you. Which of these six principles do you think is the most crucial one for avoiding fragile software designs? Let me know in the comments below.